One of the congregations that I uh, have served, you know, I've preached for in the past, and uh, that continues to provide support for uh, BibleTalk.tv, uh, the ministry, is the uh, Canyon View Church of Christ in San Diego, California. There's a nice picture. You see those palm trees, always nice, you know, when you're, if you're the preacher in your office, you can see palm trees out your window. It's, it's, it's a pretty nice deal. Very nice church, very great people there. I mentioned them this morning because they also support and are involved in what's called prison ministry as they support and work with a fellow named, a brother named Carl Etchison, who works with inmates in the Houston uh, prison system. Carl is in, uh, involved in uh, you know, organizing various worship and devotional services. He also conducts Bible studies, he does counseling, you know, prison ministry. And they, they, um, the typical work that they do, very successful work that they do. And like all other prison ministers, Carl believes that part of helping these people come out of the cycle of crime and imprisonment is to cultivate their spiritual lives. That's his objective. If they have a spiritual life, if they have faith, you know, they, won't, they won't fall back into the old habits and the old ways with the old people and then find themselves back in prison. You know? And so this motivates uh, his uh, work. Uh, he understands uh, that if there is no effort at rehabilitation, there will surely be a falling back into the old ways, so to speak. The principle is not only a key in reforming people who have a pattern of criminal behavior, believe it or not, it is also true in the lives of each one of us who deals with a pattern of sin in our lives as well. Paul talked about that in his uh, communion uh, remarks. You know, some days I'm, I'm really saved, you know, I'm really getting it, I'm really you know, resisting. And then there are other days when it's like, wow, I, am I making it? Am I even saved? Does God even still love me after what I just did or said or thought or whatever? Did you ever, did you ever have that moment where you say to yourself, I can't believe I just had that thought. I can't believe I just thought that about doing that or saying that. What's the matter with me? You know? So we're people who fall back. It's part of our sinful nature. And if there's no effort at rehabilitation from the sins that we commit, then we're doomed to repeat these over and over again to our own suffering and sorrow. And so the Bible, it gives many examples of people sinning repeatedly against God and what happened to them. In First Chronicles, however, we have an episode where David, you know, King David, not only sins and is punished, but we have a description of the rehabilitation process that he went through that would make him a better and a wiser man. Perhaps in reviewing this passage this morning, we can learn not only how to deal with our sins on a day-to-day -day basis, but also how to stop repeating those things that we dearly would love to eliminate from our lives. You have to believe it's possible. It's possible, it's called sanctification. It's possible to overcome some of the things that we do that we don't want to do or lessen you know, the number of times that we, we do this thing. So let's have a little bit of background information here uh, and we'll read uh, uh, First Chronicles chapter 18 verses one to three. It says, now after this it came about that David defeated the Philistines and subdued them and took Gath and its towns from the hand of the Philistines. He defeated Moab and, and the Moabites became servants to David bringing tribute. David also defeated Hadadezer, king of Zobah, as, as far as Hamath, and he went to establish his rule to the Euphrates River. So basically this passage here uh, says that after David ascended to the throne, 
Uh, he pursued the goal of establishing his borders to the point where God had originally promised, and that is to the great river to the north. Well, that's what kings do. You know, they establish their territory. Well, that's what David did, and this is what this passage talks about. So we keep reading in verse uh, 14 to 17. So David reigned over all Israel and he administered justice and righteousness for all his people. Joab, the son of Zariah was over the army and uh, Jehoshaphat, the son of uh, Ahilud was recorder. And Zadok, the son of Ahitab uh, and Abimelech, the son of Abiathar were priests. And Shavshah was secretary and Beniah the son of Jehoiada was over the Cherethites and the Pelethites. And the sons of David were chiefs at the, at the king's site. And so here what we see is a, a kingdom that is organized. You know, it's at peace, it's prospering, it's well organized, it's functioning smoothly under the various officials, all beneath the sovereignty of God. So this is the good, this is, everything is good. So in chapter 21, verses one to seven, a problem occurs and let's read that. It says, then Satan stood up against Israel and moved David to number Israel, meaning he wanted to take a census. So David said to Joab and to the princes of the people, go number Israel from Beersheba even to Dan and bring me word that I may know their number. And Joab said, may the Lord add to his people a hundred times as many as they are, but my Lord, the King, are they not all my Lord's servants? Why does my Lord seek to do this thing? Why should he be a cause of guilt to Israel? Nevertheless, the King's word prevailed against Joab. Therefore Joab departed and went through, uh, throughout all Israel and came to Jerusalem. Joab gave the number of the census of all the people to David and all Israel were uh, 1,100,000 men who drew the sword and Judah was 470,000 men who drew the sword. But he did not number Levi and Benjamin among them, those are two tribes, for the king's command was abhorrent to Joab. God was displeased with this thing, so he struck Israel. Well, nothing lasts forever. And when a good thing is happening, you can be sure that Satan will oppose it or try to destroy it. Whether it's a country or a marriage or a relationship or just whenever a good thing's going on, you can be sure that he's going to try to destroy that thing. In this situation, Satan successfully tempts David into ordering a census of the people. Now, there's nothing wrong in counting the population. It had been done before to prepare the nation for war. We read about that in Numbers 24. However, in a time of peace, a census for this king could only serve certain purposes. It was either to prepare for taxing the people or to establish a system for forced labor or to satisfy the king's ego concerning the strength of his nation and his army. Of course, in this nation, God is the one who provided for all the needs and forbade the forced enslavement of fellow Jews and received the glory of the people. They were his people, not the king's. He only knew, he, meaning God, is the only one who knew their number. That this action was wrong is seen by the resistance to do so of David's top officer, Joab. He didn't want to do it. Not only does he tell the king it is wrong, he warns him of the consequences and even tries to sabotage the plan by not counting you know, two of the tribes. Now, once the sin had been accomplished, however, God revealed the sin and showed his displeasure by bringing a plague on the nation. You see, if the sin was to number the people, then the punishment was to reduce that number through sickness and death. And so in the balance of this chapter, we see how David deals with this sin 
and the process of rehabilitation that he goes through that would eventually enable him to finish his reign faithfully and effectively serving the Lord. This is where we get to the four R's of rehabilitation. So in the account of this, uh, some story in uh, the same story, but this time in 2 Samuel, we read that David felt guilty about what was happening to the nation because of what he had done. That's in 2 Samuel 24, 10. This guilt led him to the first step in his process of rehabilitation from sin. And the first step, of course, is realization. The first R of rehabilitation is realization. It says in Chronicles 21, eight, David said to God, I have sinned greatly in that I have done this thing, but now please take away the iniquity of your servant for I have done very foolishly. Note that the first thing that David does after his troubled conscience moves him to examine his conduct is to acknowledge his wrongdoing. He not only acknowledges that what he has done is wrong without any excuses, no watering down. He also takes the full responsibility for it and he admits the foolishness of what he had done. A king who has brought calamity on the people that he's charged with protecting. This is usually the hardest part of rehabilitation, recognizing and admitting our fault and our need to change. The second step or the second R in rehabilitation is repentance. In verses nine to 14, we read, the Lord spoke to Gad, David's seer, prophet, saying, go and speak to David, saying, thus says the Lord, I offer you three things. Choose for yourself one of them, which I will do to you. So Gad came to David and said to him, thus says the Lord, take for yourself either three years of famine or three months to be swept away before your foes while the sword of your enemies overtakes you or else three days of the sword of the Lord, even pestilence in the land and the angel of the Lord destroying throughout all the territory of Israel. Now therefore consider what answer I shall return to him who sent me. David said to Gad, I am in great distress. Please let me fall into the hand of the Lord for his mercies are very great, but do not let me fall into the hand of man. So the Lord sent a pestilence on Israel. 70,000 men of Israel fell. And so once he realizes what he has done and acknowledges it, God is ready to deal with him. He does so by revealing the consequences of his sin on the nation. In his mercy, he allows David to choose which of the three he's going to suffer. He can face the wrath of nature. He can face the wrath of his enemies, or he can face the wrath of God himself. Of course, all three things are controlled by God, but what is interesting is which David chose and why. He chooses to be dealt with directly by God, hoping that God's mercy will be upon him. In this, we see David's repentance at work in a very real way. He showed that in the worst of circumstances, he was ready to trust in God. His sin had been to not trust in God by measuring his own strength and power reflected in the number of people he ruled. His repentance was not simply to suffer the consequences of his sins. I mean, that's punishment. No, his repentance or change, and that's what repentance is, was to go back and trust in God again. That was the repentance. Some people think repentance is punishment. I'm just going to suffer the consequences and that's it. I've repented. No, repentance is I change. I change the way I think. I change my estimate of what I am, who I am, how I am, whatever that is. I change that because that is what got me into this, uh, into this sin. His mistrust 
of God led him to trust in himself. His repentance required him to return and place all of his trust in the Lord once again, regardless of the pain. Let's face it, losing 70,000 men would decimate his army and feeling of security. He would truly have to trust in the Lord now. Sometimes mistrust has to become trust. Sometimes giving in has to give way to saying no. Sometimes doing nothing must become a commitment to give and serve and be responsible for a change. Whatever the sin, in order to move away from its grip on us, there needs to be a change concerning it. Otherwise, we are doomed to repeat it over and over and over again. It's not enough to say, I feel bad about this. I don't like myself because of this. Repentance requires change. And if there's no change, there's no repentance. The third R in rehabilitation is restitution. Verses 15 to 17, let's read that. It says, and God sent an angel to Jerusalem to destroy it. But as he was about to destroy it, the Lord saw and was sorry over the calamity and said to the destroying angel, it is enough. Now relax your hand. And the angel of the Lord was standing by the threshing floor of Ornan, the Jebusite. Then David lifted up his eyes and saw the angel of the Lord standing between the earth and heaven with his drawn sword in his hand stretched out over Jerusalem. Then David and the elders covered with sackcloth fell on their faces. David said to God, is it not I who commanded to count the people? Indeed, I am the one who has sinned and done very wickedly, but these sheep, what have they done? O oh Lord my God, please let your hand be against me and my father's household, but not against your people that they should be plagued. And so David did not blame others for his sin. And this was you know, very noble of him. But when you, you mess up, your nobility doesn't help the guy that you've ruined because of your sin. People died because of him. The nation became vulnerable because of his failure. David realized that there was a price to pay and he was not willing for others to pay the price. You see, a key moment in rehabilitation process is when you desire to pay for your mistake, when you want to do whatever it takes to make things right. In David's case, he saw that the only thing he could and should offer was his own life in exchange for the ones in danger of losing their lives. David learned two valuable lessons right here. Number one, sin causes death. The people died because of his sin. And the second thing he learned, only a life given up could pay for a life ruined by sin. In other words, a life for a life. Again, a noble gesture on his part, but how could his one sinful life atone for the sin that had caused the destruction of so many other lives, including his own? The desire to make restitution is so important in the process of rehabilitation because it humbles us and it forces us to accept mercy and grace in the knowledge that when it comes to sin, we don't have what it takes to make restitution. It's also vitally important because it opens the door to the final step in complete rehabilitation. Rehabilitation requires realization, repentance, restitution, and finally, restoration. Restoration. First Chronicles 21, we read, then the angel of the Lord commanded Gad to say to David that David should go up and build an altar to the Lord on the threshing floor of Ornan the Jebusite. So David went up at the word of Gad, which he spoke in the name of the Lord. Now Ornan turned back and saw the angel and his four sons who were with him hid themselves. And Ornan was threshing wheat. 
As David came to Ornan, Ornan looked and saw David and went out from the threshing floor and prostrated himself before David with his face to the ground. Then David said to Ornan, give me the site of this threshing floor that I may build on it an altar to the Lord for the full price you shall give it to me that the plague may be restrained from the people. Ornan said to David, take it for yourself and let my Lord the king do what is good in his sight. See, I will give the oxen for burnt offerings and the threshing sledges for wood and the wheat for the grain offering. I will give it all. But the King David said to Ornan, no, but I will surely buy it for the full price for I will not take what is yours for the Lord or offer a burnt offering which costs me nothing. So David gave Ornan 600 shekels of gold by weight uh, for, the, uh, uh, for the site. Then David built an altar to the Lord there and offered burnt offerings and peace offerings. And he called to the Lord and he answered him with fire from heaven on the altar of burnt offering. The Lord commanded the angel and he put his sword back in his sheath. So David's attempt to offer himself as restitution for the sin in order to save the people this showed his sincere desire to be restored to God. I mean, he was offering his own life. Of course, his method would not work. Why? Well, he was sinful and his sacrifice, even of himself, would not be pure, would not be acceptable to God. God provided a way that would be possible for him to be restored. In other words, he told them, build an, alt build an altar and offer a sacrifice to the Lord. Now the story of his negotiations with Ornan demonstrates the sincerity of his faith and his desire to please God. You know, he refused to accept the site for free. You know, he says, I'll pay the full price. I don't want to offer to God something that costs me nothing. Now, did the, I asked the question, did the offering of the animals take away the sin? Did the burning of sacrifice make up for all those people who died? Of course not. God merely provided a way that David could demonstrate his repentance, a way where he could express his faith and his trust in God, a way that he could show his obedience and receive peace of mind and a clear conscience. God provided a way for David to accomplish all of these things. And this was no theoretical peace, no symbolic restoration of David to a right relationship with God. After all, the angel did put up his sword. The plague was stopped. David was permitted to go ahead and plan for the building of a temple which his son would eventually complete. His rehabilitation was complete once he was restored to a right and peaceful relationship with God. You know, in the world, they say you're truly rehabilitated once your debt to society has been paid. But the whole man, body and spirit, is not totally rehabilitated until he is at peace with God and nothing is left between them. And so each of us sins, each of us causes a, a breach between ourselves and God even if it doesn't cause the death of other people. And for many of us, this is a repeated pattern in our lives. We do the same things over and over again. In order to break free, we need to follow David's example of rehabilitation from sin. First, realize that what we're doing is wrong. Own up to our sins and the damage they do in our lives and the possible damage that they can do in the lives of other people. Secondly, make a real change called repentance. The only way to successfully repent is to decide every single day that you will not repeat that sin again. Even when you fail, you get up and say, I'm not going to do this again. Thirdly, make restitution when you can. You know, deciding to make things right will show your mercy and bring you in line with God's mercy. And then finally, 
be restored. You know, God made a way for David in an impossible situation and he can make a way for you. Think about it for a second. Think about it. How was David going to make up for the thousands of people who died because of what he did? Just exactly what could he do to make up for that? What could he do in the future to be able to live and, and breathe and have a clear conscience and not walk around feeling guilty and burdened for the rest of his life? What could he do? Well, God made a way for David in an impossible situation. And we know what that is. Jesus Christ paid the price on the cross in order to pay the debt for all of David's sins. You see, David's sins were washed away by the blood of Christ. God, when he told David to make a, you know, a sacrifice and to offer up a sacrifice, God had his eye on the cross when he forgave David his sin. God opens up a way for every one of us to come to him. Not through the way of animal sacrifice and burnt peace offerings on an altar, but a, a living way. And we've said this many times, I've heard it many times in lessons and sermons, but it's very true. All the sins that took place before the cross were sent forward to the cross for eventual forgiveness. And all the sins that were committed after the cross are all sent back to the cross for total forgiveness. God provides a living way, Jesus Christ, in the watery grave of baptism. God offers baptism in Jesus' name as the way to demonstrate our faith and our repentance, as the way to receive the forgiveness and the peace of mind today. David was told, build an, off, uh, build an altar, offer a sacrifice. This is the way that you will be right with God once again. Today we say, repent of your sins and be baptized for the forgiveness of your sins and you'll receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. That's the message that God makes today to those who are burdened with sin. And so God offers baptism in Jesus' name as the way to demonstrate our faith, our repentance, as the way to receive forgiveness and peace of mind today. And so I encourage you, the way is open for you now. Uh, if you're a Christian and you're burdened and you need to be sure that you're forgiven, well, uh, 1 John chapter 1, verses seven to nine tells us that if we ask God, if we confess our sins and ask for forgiveness, he'll forgive us and the blood of Christ will wash those sins away. That's how Christians you know, deal with their everyday sins. But if you haven't ever uh, dealt with Christ, if you've never confessed his name, then we ask and encourage you to begin your rehabilitation, your spiritual rehabilitation today. And that's by coming for forgiveness and restoration by confessing the name of Jesus and being buried with him in the waters of baptism. If you need to respond in any way to this invitation this morning, we encourage you to do so now as we stand and as we sing the, uh, the song of encouragement.